I came from Syria, they started shooting and I was my children and suddenly a bullet hit my daughter. What am I proud about with uh, in Mal you know, it's been an interesting time uh, in Malaysia, across the world, with this COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's pushed humanity to its limits, to its edge. And in doing so, we've, ha we've had some ugliness, but we've had also many very beautiful opportunities to see the best in humanity come out. Um, and for me, something that really uh, impacted me in the past six months was uh, I think it was around June where we had uh, a surge of, of uh, I think, white flags being raised and the community, Malaysians, uh, migrant workers, refugees, stateless people, everybody, anybody, people that were in need were reaching out for help. And uh, Fuji stepped in to also support uh, by uh, fundraising from everybody to be able to support through food, uh, medicine, healthcare, um, and, and hygiene products for the community. And what was really beautiful about that was seeing people come together. You know, Malaysia has, like any country, we have our share of problems. We have things that divide us and people that divide us. But this instance showed us um, that when times get tough, uh, this is an opportunity for all, all people to come together because what really binds us is our humanity. Well, I think when you look around, there are always countries that are that are not as not doing as well, and there are all countries that are doing better. And so, I think it's really important to, as a nation and as our, for our leadership, to be able to assess ourselves in all different ways. So, I, I think right now it's a really interesting time because of what's happened with the pandemic. People are people are in pain. People are suffering economically. Um, mentally, emotionally, there's, there's a stress that is, is, is running through everyone's veins at the moment. Um, and I think it really does, I think it shines a big light on our leadership to see how they're going to also support the country and support people in being able to overcome this. Um, looking at jobs creation, looking at people being able to get back to work. I also feel that um, Something that I think we can all learn a little bit more about is life is a life is a two-way street. You give and you get. You give and you take. Um, I think our generation now, and even the generation that's very much on Twitter and social media, it's like we we enjoy calling someone out and you know the cancel culture. We blame you. You made a mistake. You're terrible. And then we say nasty things yeah cyberbullying we say a lot of nasty things we're really mean we're really harsh we're really critical and intolerant and we're like yeah you're, you're wrong I'm right what is that you know there are times when it's okay but a lot of times it's unnecessary um, we talk about values of respect values of, of tolerance of understanding um, of integrity these are all two-way streets and I think we really need to learn that and practice it. It's not just, what are you gonna do for me? How are you gonna treat me? What are you gonna give me? But it's also, what can I do? What can, what, how should, if I expect all of this, how should I be as a person? It's, and it's, I think this is a universal human value. It's, it, it's in all the religions. It's, um, it's in all different uh, f uh, philosophies of, you know, you, this, this two-way street. So I, I think that's a very, critical thing that we really need to we really need to think about more and we need to live it i think the pandemic exposed a lot of the gaps a lot of the holes that exist here when it comes to supporting not just refugees but vulnerable communities and that includes refugees it includes a lot of stateless individuals it uh that don't have citizenship it includes um, poorer Malaysians, it includes our homeless, uh, uh, so many of the children in Malaysia who are orphans, um, a lot of communities, even the LGBT community, a lot of people really felt, uh, were really felt, I think, abandoned. And not only that, they had nobody to turn to, hence the white flag that I surrender, I need help, somebody help me. Do you know what I mean? Um, going back to refugees, it, it, it showed us that there is no safety blanket, there's no safety net for refugees. 
uh, like a lot of vulnerable communities, they work in Fuji, we, don't, we can't help 200,000 refugees in Malaysia. UNHCR also has its limitations. So, and, they, and, the, and turning to the government to help is also not really something possible. So being evicted from there, not having money for food, a lot of these real challenges that people face. But like I said, I think a lot of people, communities face this as well. Um, and I think there's also the fear factor, which I should talk about, right? The fear factor of refugees are not considered Yes, they have a refugee card, which gives them some degree of protection. However, in Malaysia, legally, they're still considered illegal, illegal immigrants, right? They're still labeled illegal, which is not fair and it's not correct. And there was a lot of fear. If I go out and uh, if I get caught, if I get detained, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to be put in lockup and detention center? Who's going to get me out? So there's a lot of fears then with moving, going out, leaving their home. Many people are also scared to get their vaccinations. Yeah, of course, many. Um, in Malaysia, also in Lebanon, uh, I've had the, the opportunity to visit refugees in, in Lebanon. Uh, a few years ago when the Syrian crisis was very, uh, it was huge. Uh, there were Syrians, uh, thousands and thousands of Syrians fleeing, millions in fact, and uh, many would cross the border from Syria into Lebanon. And I went to Lebanon on a, hum on a humanitarian trip and we went to Bakar Valley, which is like sort of a mountainous desert area. And we visited this refugee family and they were living not even in a house. It was like a tent, a tent in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we went into the house and the mom invited us to sit in her, on the ground with her children. And, and she was speaking in Arabic. And uh, she said, you know, I, I she was telling us about her journey. I came from Syria. They started shooting and I was my children and suddenly a bullet hit my daughter and it killed my daughter and a stray bullet and she had to carry her child, her dead child on her like this all the way for hours and hours until she came to Lebanon and then she asked me, um, she's like, sister, would you like to come and see where I buried her? Less than 50 meters from their house in the middle of nowhere. And I think that for me, like when I tell you that, like, it's very, it's, that's what it means to be a refugee, you know? When people don't understand what it, refugees, refugees, go back, don't come here, you don't know Malaysia, you don't follow our culture, leave, get back, get, get away. The refugees are so rude, you know? When people say things like this, and you see it on social media, you see it on, on, on in, in people write it. Then the story, it reminds me, of, this is what it means to be a refugee. And I don't think anybody would want to go through that. You know, I think we all have opportunities to learn from things. And this pandemic pushed us to a point of like, it's a new experience for all of us. No one imagined that they would have to live through this. And people have lost loved ones. Um, things, a lot of things may never go back to what we consider normal. Many things will change perhaps forever. And I think with that comes opportunities to learn, opportunities to perhaps be more human again, to be more connected, to realize I think that my problem can very easily become your problem.